So hello, everyone. Good afternoon if you're in Sweden, in Europe. Good evening if you're in Asia. Good morning if you're in North America. My name is Jens Gakov. Um, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Mabtech, and I will be your host and presenter for this webinar on fluorospot in cell and gene therapy. Uh, and with me today, I have uh, Maria and Esther, uh, two of our application specialists. Uh, and I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves. Maria. Yes. Hello. Uh, so my name is Maria Carvoni. I'm a field application specialist from Aptec. Uh, it's already been nine months now. Uh, my background is in pharmacy and then I uh, have research experience with both gene therapy in adenine associate viruses and also cell therapy. I was mostly working with multiple myeloma and the cell, cell therapy product we were developing was uh, CARNK cells and CAR T cells, anti uh, CD38. Um, so, yeah, basically now I'm working to support the customers in Europe, UK, and Ireland in uh, developing essays for their applications or troubleshooting their um, essays. All right. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Esther, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, so my name is Esther. I've done my PhD at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. I focused on CAR T cells, mostly for solid tumors during this time. And I got the opportunity to work with Fluorospot already. And uh, after finishing my PhD, I joined Maptech in 2023. Great, thank you. So as you can hear, Maria and Esther, they are the, the true experts here. Uh, I'm more of a fan. Uh, of the cell and gene therapy space. Um, but I will do my best in presenting how Fluorospot can be used in, in this context. Um, we have one hour for this webinar, <clears throat> and I'm thinking I will present for around 40 minutes uh, and then leave 20 minutes uh, for questions and answers. Um, please ask your questions in the Q&A window that you can find down there in the menu. And, and post whenever you want to. Uh, Esther and Maria will make sure to, to read them and, and think of answers during. And then when I'm done presenting, we will go through uh, questions and, and Maria and Esther and perhaps me, uh, we can try to answer those questions. For your information, uh, we are recording this webinar uh, and you will, we will share it to you afterwards and we will also post it on our YouTube channel. Um, I think that was the information I needed to give. So then I'm going to share my screen and begin the presentation. Like that. And you can see my screen now, Maria and Esther. Yes, all good. All good. Okay, great. So the agenda for today, I'm just going to make a laser pointer here as well, is <clears throat> first I'm going to uh, briefly talk about like the vast landscape of immunotherapy um, to which cell and gene therapy uh, belongs. Then I'm going to talk a bit about FDA guidelines that uh, are connected to this to cell and gene therapy. And after that, uh, give you a brief introduction to Elispot and Fluorospot so that we're all on the same page, what, what, what these methods actually are. And then for the main part of this, of this webinar, I'm going to go through Elispot and Fluorospot in different cell and gene therapy um, contexts. And I've chosen three here. <clears throat> there are many different uh, cell and gene therapy strategies, but for the sake of not staying here, here the entire night, we will go through three of them. So chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy, and then finally gene therapy using viral vectors. So if we begin then with this <clears throat> landscape of immunotherapy, I mean, this is a, it's, it's an enormous and ever evolving field uh, in which we find cancer vaccines and bispecific T cell engagers. We have different ways of targeting and, and, uh, and masking cytokines so that they have their effects on, on, at the site of, of, uh, um, of the tumor, for example. 
We also have checkpoint inhibitors, so different types of antibody therapies, checkpoint inhibitors. You all know that um, Tas Tasuku Honjo and James P. Allison got the Nobel Prize for this discovery back in 2018. James P. Allison, by the way, used Ellisbot in many of his papers <laughs> coming to this conclusion. Uh, and to, as, as said, to not make it too big, this, I'm, I'm focusing then on CAR T cells, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and gene therapy using viral vectors. And <clears throat> yes, I mean, there is a lot of oncology, a lot of immune oncology here. I mean, this image that I've adapted, it, it's, it is even from a journal called Cardio Oncology. But it's important to, to understand that these powerful therapies also lend themselves very well to autoimmunity and, and other hereditary diseases. Um, and in the case of gene therapy using viral vectors, I'm going to actually go through um, such uh, uh, um, an application for a hereditary disease. So developing therapies like these, um, you need basically to, to, to answer two important questions. One is whether the therapy is potent enough. Uh, and the other one is, is it safe and durable? And FDA has uh, put together a bunch of documents uh, regarding these different developments of, of different uh, immunotherapies. And I'm going to get, go through two of them with you. <clears throat> so when it comes to potency, is, is it potent enough? Here to the right, you see an example of such a document. In this case, it's for CAR T cells. So this document is called Considerations for the Development of Chimeric Antigen Receptor T Cell Products Guidance for Industry. And on page 14 of this document, there is a text regarding potency assays. And I'm just going to read straight off this, this uh, document then. Upon antigen engagement, CAR T cells kill target cells using multiple mechanisms. Therefore, the use of orthogonal methods, for example, cell killing assays, transduction efficiency measurements, and cytokine secretion assays may be recommended to measure potency. Characterization of CAR T cell function during product development will support comparability studies and will allow you to determine the most appropriate assays to use for commercial lot re release. Okay, so this is a non-binding recommendation and it is specific for CAR T cells. But I would argue that the same evaluation of cytokine secretion could or actually should be considered for any therapy involving cellular immune responses including then tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy or transgenic TCR T cells, for example. And evaluating cytokine secretion could be done by using, for example, Ellispot and Fluorospot. Before going into what Ellispot and Fluorospot is for everyone, I'm just going to go through one more example. And that is then guidelines regarding unwanted immunogenicity, and safety and durability. So here's an example uh, uh, from an FDA document called Human Gene Therapy for Hemophilia, Guidance for Industry. And in this document on page 11, regarding monitoring of safety and durability, FDA writes, we recommend periodic monitoring for levels of vector-related antibodies and assessing interferon gamma secretion from PBMCs by Ellispot assays for the detection of anti-vector and anti-coagulation factor T cell reactivity. So again, this is a non-binding recommendation and it is for gene therapy of hemophilia, but the same evaluation of cellular immune responses, they're also mentioned in another document regarding uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And I would argue that they could or should be considered for any gene therapy involving viral vectors. And you could do this, for example, by using Ellisbot as FDA mentioned, but also, or even better perhaps, Fluorospot. 
Okay, so what is Alice Bot and Forest Bot to get everyone on the same page? Well, in this context, they are cytokine secretion assays of extreme sensitivity. You can use the Alice Bot and Forest Bot to study antibody secretions from B cells as well. And our application specialist Renata has made an excellent presentation on that, that you can find on our YouTube channel. But in this context of cell and gene therapy, Alispot and Forspot are cytokine secretions assays of extreme sensitivity. So the assay principle of both Alispot and, and Forspot, it resembles a, a sandwich ELISA um, in which you have a 96 well plate where you have capture antibodies coated to the bottom of each well. But the difference between ELISA and Alispot and Forspot is that in ELISA, you add your serum or your plasma or supernatant to each well. Whereas in Alispot and Forspot, you add your cell suspension and you stimulate your cells within each well. <clears throat> and you can do this for however long you want to. When a cell gets activated by your stimulus, it starts to secrete cytokine and you capture everything that's being secreted. And you can do this for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. You just capture everything that's being secreted immediately upon secretion. Then you wash away the cells and you add a detection antibody that in the case of Elispot is conjugated to an enzyme that cleaves a substrate that precipitates down into the bottom of the wells and forms spots. So each spot is the footprint of a single cell that was there secreting the cytokine of interest. The assay principle of Florespot is basically the same, but it's the multiplex version of Elispot. So instead of an enzymatic detection system, you have a fluorescent detection system, which allows you to multiplex and study four different cytokines simultaneously. Both these methods are robust, high throughput and easy to standardize. So they lend themselves well, well to multi-center trials, for example. And their thing, what really makes them stand out is their sensitivity. If one cell out of, let's say 250,000, if one cell responds, that will form a spot and you will find it. So <clears throat> when I came to MubTech in, in 2015, I had done a lot of flow cytometry. And I couldn't really, like during the first week, I couldn't really figure out why in the world would you do a, a fluorospot assay when you might as well do a, 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 an intracellular cytokine staining and a flow cytometry readout. But after a week or so, I, I finally understood that it's, it's about the sensitivity. Because in, in flow cytometry, you need to block cytokine secretion so that you can stain the cytokines intracellularly. And this blockage, whether you use, you use brepholdine A or, or Golgi stop or monensin, <clears throat> it's kind of toxic to the cells. They don't like being blocked like this. So you have a shorter time window. I, I would argue maximum 12 hours, but, but rather six hours. Some people do four hours. Um, of, of the stimulation, which increases the risk that you miss early or late producing cells. You have a shorter time window here where you can do your analysis. And if you place your readout in a suboptimal place, you risk missing out on finding cells. In contrast, Ellisbot and Florisbot, you, sec <clears throat> you capture all secreted cytokine throughout the whole stimulation process. So you have a much, much longer time window. You can do this as said for 24 hours or 48 hours or even 72 hours, which allows you to de detect all cells that are secreting cytokine, early secretors, but also late secretors. In this sensitivity also makes fluorospot require fewer cells to be functional. 
in in uh, in a normal flow cytometry assay you would need around a million cells but you can get away with much much fewer cells in fluorospot than spot. So if you would like to read about a direct comparison between fluorospot and spot and intracellular cytokine staining Shauva and colleagues wrote a, a, an interesting comparison back in in 2014 you can check that out so other common cytokine release assays uh, being used uh, are like ELISA and its multiplex versions like Luminex and MSD um, and, and multiplex assays like that. And again, like comparing to those, again, fluorospot and Elisabeth are great when you need high sensitivity. Because in essence, if you, if you remember then ELISA and multiplex, you study the plasma or supernatant. So in essence, you capture cytokines after, long after they have been secreted. And that increases the risk of, of having a, a dilution effect of the cytokine you're looking for. It also increases the risk that cells, neighboring cells, consume the cytokine before you have a chance to analyze it. Then this is the case of um, um, with the interleukin-4, for example. It's being secreted, and the neighboring cells are consuming it. So when you get to your ELISA or your Luminex assay, there's no IL-4 there to be detected. In contrast, Elisbot and Fluorospot, <clears throat> you capture cytokines upon their secretion. You capture everything at the moment of secretion and throughout the stimulation. Also, the readout is, is uh, different than, of course, in Elisbot and Fluorospot. Your measurement is number, the number of cytokine secreting cells. Whereas in ELISA and, and Luminex MSD, the readout is a concentration of an analyte. So being so sensitive, uh, Elispot and Fluorospot are used in many different contexts to evaluate immune responses. In, <clears throat> used a lot in vaccine development, used in diagnostics of different infectious diseases, especially when there's a latent infection and there's a high need of, of, of high sensitivity, like in tuberculosis and Lyme disease, but it's also used in different types of immunotherapies. And we are going to go through them, <clears throat> three of them now, CAR T cells, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and gene therapies using viral vectors. <clears throat> so let's begin with CAR T cells. <clears throat> Excuse me. So <clears throat> the goal of a chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy is to produce T cell reactivity that's not naturally present. What you basically do is that you isolate T cells from the patient's blood, and then you insert a CAR gene into the T cell. And that gene is expressed into a CAR protein. And a CAR protein is essentially uh, a mix between a T cell receptor and an antibody. Extracellularly, you have an antibody, and intracellularly, you have a T cell receptor machinery that can start the T cell. <clears throat> so then you uh, expand these CAR T cells so that you have millions of them and you infuse them back into the patient and they find cancer cells and start killing them, like homing missiles. Um, there are many different challenges to a CAR T cell development um, uh, project. Sorry. Um, and uh, I mean, you have on-target um, toxicity and off-target toxicity and all kinds of different other challenges. And I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to go through two basically of them. So there is a lack, potential lack of potency of the CAR T cell. And there's also a risk that the patient's immune system will um, recognize the CAR as something foreign and, and reject it. So <clears throat> here are then some questions to ask regarding potency. And there are some questions that you can ask already before infusion. So first of all, are the CAR T cells able to kill cancer cells? You can study this by killing assays. So chromium, chromium release assays, for example. Another question you can ask is, 
do the CAR T cells activate in the presence of a target? Um, and for this, you can then mix CAR T cells with the target and then do an early spot or a floor spot assay. And I have made this question in bold and in pink. And for the rest of this webinar then, then you can understand <clears throat> that that means that there will be a case study coming afterwards. Uh, we have raised hands here. I'm not sure. Uh, we, we're going to go through questions afterwards. Um, okay, so analytes of interest here uh, would be interferon gamma, but also the cytotoxic granzyme B and pro-inflammatory TNF alpha. So a case study then for whether the CAR T is activate in the presence of target. So this is a study by Atanakovic et al, um, where the authors had previously seen uh, that not only interferon gamma, but also granzyme B and TNF was found in the supernatant after a co-culture and cell killing. And they wondered whether this can, can this be translated into a single cell level assessment that one could use before infusing uh, the cells to find, to identify secretory profiles of CAR T cells that would be associated with durable responses. So <clears throat> in this study, the authors took CAR T cells and mixed them with, in this case, CD19 coated beads. So CD19 here is the tumor associated associated antigen that the CAR T cells is, is, uh, specific, are specific for. And then they did a floor spot readout. And I think already here, it's, it's a quite interesting concept. They're using target coated beads instead of target cancer cells. And that really allows for standardiz standardization of antigen expression levels. Uh, and also minimizes the, the differences in alloreactivity. <clears throat> but anyway, the authors, did this floor spot assay and, and saw that, yes, in from gamma granzyme B and TNF, they're great for characterizing CAR T cells. Whereas other cytokines like IL-4, IL-5, and IL-10, they were practically absent. There's no use looking at those. So the advantages of utilizing floor spot in this study was, according to the authors, that there is a, an increased clinical relevance by studying active secretion of cytokines like this using floor spot compared to, for example, just the production that you, that you study in, a, in an intracellular cytokine staining and flow cytometry assay. Another uh, advantage, according to the authors, was that this assay can be performed overnight, allowing for fast delivery of the product to the patient. Well, a flow cytometry assay can also be done quite quickly. Okay, so that was that case study. Um, other questions you could ask re regarding potency in the context of CAR T cells is whether, of course, after infusion, do the CAR T cells reduce tumor size? Do they increase survival? And you can study this by, by checking the animal weight. If, you, if it's a mouse model, you can study the survival curve. If it's a patient, you can study tumor size assessment and stuff like that. Another question, is whether CAR T cells activate upon re-challenge with cancer cells. So here you would isolate CAR T cells after infusion and mix them, co-culture them with cancer cells and then do a floor spot readout. And again, the analytes, the cytokines that would be of interest here is in from gamma and the cytotoxic granzyme B and the pro-inflammatory TNF. <clears throat> and as you can see, there will be a new a new case study now. So does the CAR activate CAR T cell activate on rechallenge with cancer cells? So this is actually a, a paper, a study made by Esther, um, Esther Shutrup, our expert here that can answer questions later on. So what she did was an ex vivo analysis of CAR T cells in a mouse model of ovarian cancer. So she had uh, three different constructs three different CAR constructs of a mesotelene-directed CAR T cell. And Esther wanted to know which one of these, MBBZ, M28Z, and M1XX, which one performs best ex vivo, which one has a durable and potent response, sort of. 
So what Esther did was she inoculated mice with ovarian cancer, and then she infused these three different constructs, and then <clears throat> she harvested tumor and spleen and isolated CAR T cells, and then assessed their functionality. And a challenge that Esther had in this paper was that she had very limited material. She only had a couple of hundred cells, and that's not enough to do an intracellular cytokine staining and flow cytometry. So instead, she chose to do a co-culture of CAR T cells together with the mesothelin positive target cells inside a fluorospot plate, so in each well. And then she could show that indeed, this new uh, construct, M1XX, showed superior secretion of intron gamma and TNF and granzyme B. So the advantages of using fluorospot in this study are quite obvious. Uh, a, a flow cytometry study would have been practically impossible <clears throat> because she had such a low number of CAR T cells that were required, only 800 cells per well. Another advantage of using fluorospot here is that she could do a longer incubation. She did it for 24 hours, and that allowed, to, allowed her to detect interferon gamma and granzyme B or sorry, or anti-TNF and granzyme B. Granzyme B usually takes around 24 hours to really get going before you can detect it. <clears throat> so a few more questions regarding CAR T cells before we jump over to, to tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So in clinical trials, you really need to be sure that you are safe, that, you're, that the patients are safe. And questions regarding safety and durability, um, I mean, first question is, of course, does the CAR T cell give off-target toxicity or on-target toxicity? Is there a risk for cytokine storm here? And for that, you would do, for example, um, a serology on, for, for IL-6 levels so you, using an ELISA, for example. Another question to ask is whether the product is free of pyrogens. Uh, and here you could do a monocyte activation test, a so-called MAT assay. You, you can do that using uh, different ELISAs, but you can actually also use an IL-6, IL-1 beta fluorospot assay for that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, but rather I'm going to talk to, about this third question. Is there a risk that the CAR T cell will, will be rejected? Um, and how to do that is by... Uh, co-culturing the patient's cells, PBMCs, or patient's T cells, together with a peptide pool made up from the CAR protein. And here, I mean, it's sort of the opposite now compared to a potency assay. Here, the fewer spots, the better. You don't want an immune response towards the CAR T cell itself. So, uh, a case study on the risk of CAR T cell rejection is this paper by Turtle et al. Uh, from back in 2016. Um, so the background here is that many of the approved CD19 CAR constructs, they utilize a single chain variable fragment of mouse origin. So it's not, it's not humanized, uh, it's of mouse origin. And um, in this case, uh, it was a, a patient with a non-Hodgkin lymphoma that received these CD19 CAR T cells, and he experienced a low effect. And they could come to the conclusion that the reason for that was that the CAR T cells were lysed. And they asked, why are, are these uh, CAR T cells being recognized and killed? Um, and so they did an interferon gamma Ellis spot. Uh, mixing the patient's T cells together with a CAR peptide pool and did an L spot. And then they identified that CAR peptides located within this mouse single chain variable fragment, those were the peptides that gave rise to these immune responses. <clears throat> so the advantages of using L spot in this study was that this high sensitivity of L spot uh, picked up these adverse responses to the CAR construct. If the authors would have used fluorospot instead, they could have gained more insights, uh, for example, in terms of granzyme B secretion, um, and be more sure of that these were, these, this were actually, this was actually cell killing. And next time, of course, 
this type of assessment of, of potential unwanted immunogenicity, that should be, be assessed before uh, infusion, not after. Okay, so let's jump over to tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy. <clears throat> So the goal of TIL therapy is to kickstart the natural tumor reactive T cells that are already there. Um, so you would have a lot of T cells in the tumor microenvironment, but they just, they can't really do their job. But if we take them out and kickstart them, maybe they actually could do their job. So what you do <clears throat> basically is you um, take a tumor sample and from that tumor, you isolate tumor uh, the, the lymphocytes that are inside the tumor. And then you expand them uh, in vitro, and then you infuse them back to the patient together with IL-2 infusions. And um, just with, like with CAR therapy, there are many challenges with TIL therapy. And I'm going to focus on, on one specific challenge, and that is that many tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, even though they're there, they're not tumor reactive. <clears throat> so questions to ask regarding potency of TIL products is, well, first of all, do these TILs activate against autologous tumors? So you can do then a co-culture of TILs and cancer cells and, and do a flora spot. Um, there are many, there are many uh, case studies on that. I'm not going to bring that up in this webinar. Another uh, question to ask before giving a TIL product to a patient is, is it free of pyrogens? So again, just like with CAR T cells, you can do a monocyte activation test that could be done using ELISA or fluorospot. I'm not going to talk about that either, but I'm going to talk about this third question. Does the rapid expansion protocol change the antigen specificity compared to bulk culture? So here you can take tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and stimulate them with tumor specific or associated peptides and then do a fluorospot assay. Again, just like with, with CARS, the analytes of interest should be intron gamma and granzyme B and TNF alpha. So a case study on <clears throat> does the expansion change antigen specificity or actually in this case, can the expansion improve antigen specificity? Because in this case by Sakarakis et al. Uh, from 2018, uh, the authors, I mean, already know, of course, this challenge that no, not all tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are tumor reactive. So they had a question then, could we improve the results of this therapy by expanding only tumor reactive TILs? So what they did then, they began just like you usually do by, by isolating um, the uh, uh, a biopsy of the tumor and isolating uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes from it. But what they then did was they sequenced the tumor looking for new antigens and found them and expressed them and loaded them into antigen presenting cells. And at the same time, they sorted the TILs into different subpopulations based on their TCR beta chains. And then they made a co-culture with <clears throat> this tumor antigen loaded antigen presenting cells and these TILs in different subpopulations and made an LSPOT readout. And what they could find then was that only a, a couple of these subpopulations were actually tumor reactive. And then they took only them and expanded them in culture and then infused them back to the patient. And the result in this study is quite astonishing. <clears throat> so these selected tumor reactive TILs, this is pre-treatment, <clears throat> a metastatic breast cancer. And you can see the tumor well here. And then 22 months post-treatment, the tumor is gone. Super cool. So the advantages of using Elispot in this study was that the high sensitivity of Elispot uh, allowed for this optimal detection of tumor reactivity. And if the authors, authors would have used fluorospot instead, they could of course then have chosen tumor infiltrating lymphocytes on the basis of their granzyme B secretion and the, on their basis of polyfunctionality and perhaps gotten an even better result. 
if that's even possible here. Okay, let's switch gears then and take an example of gene therapy using viral vectors. So before going into this case, uh, I think it's just important to understand that there are many different variants of gene therapy. The common theme is that you use genetic material to counteract an inherited or complex disease. And the goal is to replace the mutant gene with a healthy copy, either through gene correction, gene replacement or augmentation, or gene silencing. And you can do this ex vivo. Uh, I mean, you can, you can extract cells from the patient and then genetically modify them. For example, by giving them a CAR gene. I mean, we've already talked about this type of sort of gene therapy and then <clears throat> give them, them those cells back to the patient. But I think maybe what people mostly think of when they hear therapy is this in vivo type of gene therapy, where you deliver a gene directly to the patient using a viral vector. There are non-viral alternatives uh, as well, but that's outside, outside, outside of the scope today. Okay, so Gene therapy using viral vectors, the goal then is to replace a missing or defective gene with a transgene. And it begins by development, developing a plasmid that includes this transgene. And then you manufacture a, a viral vector in this, in this um, schematic image here, it's an adeno-associated ve viral vector that is then injected into the patient and the viral vector infects the, the uh, target cells and delivers the transgene, which is then expressed and, and uh, you get the protein that you're looking for. So a uh, challenge with utilizing viral vectors for gene therapy is that from an immunological view, viral vectors mirrors a viral infection. Um, <clears throat> so questions you should be asking here in a clinical trial, for example, is first of all, looking at the serum, does the patient already have the viral vector specific antibodies? This is commonly done in clinical trials. You do just do a direct ELISA. Another question is whether the vector give rise to unwanted innate responses. So antiviral type one interferon secretion by plasma cytoid dendritic cells, for example. You can study this using fluorospot, for example, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about this third question, whether the vector, does the vector give rise to unwanted cellular responses? Because I think we should not forget about T cells. Looking for viral vector specific antibodies is very common, but we should not forget about cellular responses. So to answer this question, one can, uh, co-culture patients' PBMCs with peptides from the viral vector and then do a fluorospot readout. And again here, the fewer cells, the better. Analytes of interest can actually be, just like we had said before, interferon gamma, but also granzyme B and TNF. So a case study on this is a paper by Catherine Patton et al. <clears throat> Uh, from 2021, uh, where the authors wanted to uh, study the immunogenicity of an adeno-associated viral vector in a phase three th trial of hemophilia. <clears throat> so the background here is that patients can have vector-specific, viral vector-specific T cells just from natural viral exposure earlier in life. <clears throat> and the authors wondered, they had previously observed elevated alanine transaminase plasma levels, and they wondered, could that be due to the transduced cells actually being killed? Um, so they did a, um, an L-spot, an interferon gamma L-spot assay, where they stimulated PBMCs with peptides from this adeno-associated viral vector 5, and also they stimulated with the transgene product because of course that could also be recognized as something foreign. And in this case, it was um, it's, since it, this was hemophilia, it was the human blood clotting factor eight. 
And the results in this study was that the cellular immune responses against the viral vector were observed, observed in most participants and only limited responses against the transgene product were detected. So uh, the authors really needed to go back to the drawing board because this viral vector was just too immunogenic. <coughs> so according to the authors, advantages of using Elispot in this study was that the Elispot assay was sensitive, precise, specific, and linear with a broad range of quantitation, the direct uh, citation from the paper. If the authors would have considered using fluorospot here, I think that could have been a, an interesting um, study because according to Gorovitz et al. <clears throat> in, a, in a paper from last year, granzyme B and TNF secreting T cells may be present as well. And evaluation of polyfunctionality could provide either for even more insights into the cell response uh, towards a, a viral vector. Okay, that was actually it. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and see if we have any questions. So if Esther and Maria comes back on the screen, um, I'm going to open the Q&A uh, section and ask questions. Um, so he, the first question is, in our previous in vivo study, Elispot worked, but Fluorospot did not. Could you shed some light on limitations of Fluorospot? Uh, I can take that answer. Uh, so a limitation with Fluorospot, as is with multiplexing, is that you need to consider um, the capture effects, which happens when you capture one analyte, but the capturing affects the secretion of another analyte. As it's, for instance, with IL-2, that when it's captured, it can uh, affect the secretion of nephron gamma. It can uh, decrease it. For some combinations, uh, th there is no problem, but for some others, we can compensate with addition of uh, CD28 antibody, for instance. And some other combinations, we can definitely recommend you to not uh, uh, add them together in a floral spot. Uh, and we do have a blog post on that on the website talking about capture effects uh, that has a very uh, nicely made table that can uh, advise you on different combinations. So it could be one possibility could be that the combination of the analytes was a problem here. Yeah. Uh, and, and... A connected question to that is, I am a bit curious about how to handle color compensation in fluorospot then. Do you need to compensate uh, for bleed over like you do in flow cytometry? Yes, so uh, actually you do not have to compensate. We have, we are using fluorophore such as it's equivalent, I3 equivalent, I5 and DAPI equivalent and filters that are uh, far away from each other enough that you do not need to compensate, actually. Hmm? So we have another question uh, regarding, <clears throat> I understand CTL response is mainly TH1, but the body also generates TH2 response because of shredded antigens. <clears throat> It's yes, I think I started answering this in the chat. So part of that question is already in answered. Um, okay. So but this was yeah. regarding the cytotherapy paper where they tested the potency assays uh, with different cytokines uh, and why no TH2 responses were detected. Um, and especially for the CD19 construct, which is used in this paper, it uh, really drives on the int in from gamma and TNF responses. I think it's Marcella Maus that has done a lot of research in which cytokines are crucial for which constructs. Uh, and this is in an in vitro setting. Um, I can share the both papers with you, Sandeep, maybe to explain it in a bit more detail. Hey, thank you very much. Um, so we have another question. 
what is the best concentration of mouse splenocytes for early spot when you're studying vaccine induced immune response? Yes, yeah, so uh, as an initial concentration, we recommend 250,000 cells per way. Uh, and this is so that you allow your cells to, um, to find the antigen, to, to have efficient antigen presentation, but also to have not multiple layers in your way so that the cells can secrete analyte and can be captured immediately beneath them on the PVDF membrane. Uh, so this is just a starting amount. We do recommend you to check different concentrations of cells uh, in order to find your um, optimal one. That's right. <clears throat> um, so another question. For, for cells that generate uh, multiple cytokines, how, how do you evaluate that in fluorospot, I guess? Um, so how, how, do you, how do you determine that a cell, uh, that that's a cell that secretes multiple analytes and not several cells, uh, neighboring cells secreting an analyte um, separately, like one each? I think with the software that we have for Fluorospot, which is the Apex software and the algorithm behind it, it allows you to check for also polyfunctionality. Uh, because with the different LEDs that are included, you can nicely align the spot center, which would uh, be one cell secreting one cytokine or several cytokines. Um, I will link the Fluorospot webinar that we have recorded with you, because uh, in here it's explained uh, in detail. Yeah, but it, it's based on on the on the position of the cell center, <clears throat> and if this if this or the spot centers, because that is where the cell <clears throat> was when it started to secrete its cytokine, and if those spot centers overlap, that is. Uh, one cell secreting both analytes uh, and not two different cells. Um, what is the least cell number, I guess, what the, the fewest number of cells that can still detect, be detected with fluorospot? I think we have a paper that detects even one uh, cell. Uh, so the setup is very sensitive, of course, this depends on how many cells you are using. If you are adding 100,000 cells, your cells are nice and happy because they will need cell-to-cell -cell contact. And if one cell is antigen-specific, you can detect this. Um, however, if you're talking more about the limit, the lower limit of cells in the wells, this depends. For instance, for CAR T cells, you will know that let's say at least 50% of your cells will respond. So you can really titrate down the number of CAR T cells per well with the target cells of interest, uh, because the target cells also add the cell to cell contact. Uh, I think I was able to titrate down to 800 CAR T cells with 800 tumor cells. Right. I mean, so so oh, of course, in in most cases, you you as Esther said, you need some kind of cell to cell contact, and it, it's it's not it's not recommended to go uh, below a hundred thousand cells or something like that. But it is possible, and especially when it comes to these these very potent CAR T cells, for example. Um, and as Maria said, we have there there is one paper. <clears throat> where a, um, a, a researcher sorted single cells, one single cell into each well and uh, detected, I think it was IL-5 and intron gamma, and it worked perfectly well. Um, another question in the chat I see here, I think we have sort of answered it already, but let's, let's take it anyway. I am wondering how Fluorospot detect four different cytokines at the same time. Uh, yes, yeah, so this basically uh, depends on the amount of cytokine uh, of antibodies, capture antibodies that you are adding to your plate or you're using a pre coated plate. So if you are um, coating with, let's say, four capture antibodies, then you will uh, capture four cytokines and be able to have a multiplex assay. 
And uh, as uh, Esther said before, uh, because of our technology and the algorithm behind it, you are able to tell uh, which uh, fluorophore corresponds to which cytokine and which cell secreted uh, how many uh, cytokines. And you can also uh, detect uh, polyfunctional T cells, for instance. Uh, so with our technology, you can definitely separate the cytokines and see uh, the cells that have secreted more than one. Thank you, Maria. Um, at the moment, there I can't see any more questions. Uh, let me know if you have if you see them, Maria and Esther. Uh, please ask uh, ask more if you have questions. You who are attending, we have nine more minutes to answer questions. In the meantime, while while waiting for more questions from the attendees, I'd I'd like to ask you, Esther. Uh, I showed that paper where M1XX construct was superior. Do you know, even if you, I, like we stole you from, from uh, the academic world and now you're working here, but have you gotten any information on whether your co former co-workers have been continuing, continuing with that construct and are there any new um, news regarding it? Uh, so the group has has continued to work with CAR T cells, but uh, not with more animal models. Uh, so to be mostly continuing with in vitro work. I know the constructs, they come from Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I think there is a trial with an MS mesothelian M1X6 construct, a clinical trial that was started, uh, but it was interrupted and not continued anymore. Um, yes. Maybe for the other constructs targeting, for instance, CD19, the journey has continued, but not for mesothelian. Okay. So we have a, a new question here. <clears throat> we are planning to test samples from many patients. Could you give any suggestion on floor spot assay standardization? I am... Um... I think Maria, your mood, yeah. Uh, one good tip would be to, if you want to standardize it, to have an intra-assay control. So you could have a PBMC control from a health individual that you use in every plate in order to standardize it and make sure that every time it works properly. And of course, uh, good controls uh, would help like negative media controls so that you assess for the serum if you're uh, changing the serum in your um, different assays. And I think it can also work uh, to, depending on what you're looking at, to maybe establish the lower limit of detection, the upper limit of detection. And if you want to take it further, also the user variability. So same experiment with the same set of cells by different users. So you can determine the intra and inter assay variability as well as your limit of detections. Yeah. Could I ask then a follow-up question? What's your thoughts on, on um, uh, setting, uh, like how many spot numbers should be considered uh, a positive response and a negative response and stuff like that? How, how, how would you think about that when setting up a, a study? In general, we recommend to use triplicates and look at the DFR method, for which we also have a blog post. And with this method, which is statistically validated, um, I think it was by John Hopkins University, uh, you can determine whether a response is positive, yes or no. So your uh, test conditions versus the background control being spontaneous release. Um, not everyone is using this method. Um, and when we screen the literature, which we do at MobTech, is that we see different ranges uh, that people are using. Some people are, for instance, using uh, a twofold increase in your test wells versus the background control is a positive response. Other people are using two times a standard deviation is an increase over background uh, or more than 50 spots. So there is some personalization with this as to how you decide uh, to determine, but the DFR method is the only statistically uh, validated method. 
Right. And I think maybe, Susie, if you're listening, uh, you can post a link to the DFR method post uh, in the chat um, for anyone who's interested in, in utilizing that statistical method for defining uh, a positive early spot or floor spot response. Um, we also had some questions that were pre-posted. Oh, that's right. Yes, so uh, starting here, is there a way to normalize the number of spots at different bench for the same experimental material? Um, so since this is a cell-based assay, or both Elispot and Fluorospot are cell-based assays, it is very difficult to normalize two different set of experiments to one another, because even though it's the same donor, there can be some uh, variability uh, from day to day due to handling of the cells. Yeah, I mean, ideally, one would have a cell that you that, that secretes a an exactly known amount of cytokine, then you would have that as a sort of standard to compare to. But there is no such cell. Um, so you can't really you can't really compare to a, a standard curve like you can do in, in ELISA. Uh, but I think the previous answers by Maria and Esther on how to standardize it, like that, those are the types of measures you, you can you can do. Were there any more uh, uh, posted questions beforehand? Yes. I, I don't see them, so maybe you could read them. Uh, yeah. Right, yeah. Oh, Maria. Uh, so actually, a question was, how can one distinguish positive from negative spots when the background is high? Uh, mm -hmm. So this is quite uh, a problem, especially in L spot, where the membrane can be overdeveloped and can lead to many background looking spots. Uh, spot, uh, that are background basically, as so are not real spots. And a uh, trick here is to increase your thresholds to check with your controls, uh, with your negative controls uh, and unstimulated cell control and to set the threshold higher so that you do not include your background in your spot counts. Okay, thank you. Were there any more? pre-posted questions or are there any more questions from the attendees here? We have three more minutes. I see, I don't see any more from the attendees here, but there is uh, two more in the pre-posted one. The difference between MSIP for B and T cell work. I've been told one needs a pre-treatment of ethanol, but I don't understand why. So Elispot and fluorospot plates, including the MSIP plates, uh, the wells have a PVDF membrane in it. And um, the PVDF membrane is inactive. And by ethanol pretreatment, the membrane gets activated and thereby can bind more anti antibody. So when you coat your wells with capture antibodies to increase the sensitivity, you want to optimize all the space in the PVDF membrane, because since it's a 3D, 3D structure. So therefore, the pre-treatment pre of ethanol is done. And this is done both for B and T cell assays. Yeah. So, I mean, when it comes to fluorospot, we mainly uh, recommend pre-coated plates or, or fluorospot plus um, format. Uh, but we also have our floor spot flex format. If there's a combination of analytes or cytokines that you that you really can't find among our plus kits, and there you have to pre-treat also the floor spot plates with with ethanol, and uh, they, they need to be sort of activated with that ethanol to be able to uh, uh, absorb enough capture antibodies. Okay, one final question then. Was there, you said it was two more. Yes. Um, if there's none from the audience. So I think it was about technical replicates. Uh, so um, this question came from someone that had a problem 
two of the whales saw the same spot count, about 120, and one had less spots, about 12, I think. Um, and, and this can be solved with, uh, with uh, maybe more care during pipetting uh, and maybe resuspending the cell suspension before adding to the, to the whales. All right. If you have more technical uh, questions, feel free to, to email us. Uh, if you have more questions regarding cell and gene therapy, Maria and Esther are here. I am also here. I can try to answer some questions. Just send, an e send us emails or contact us uh, through the contact form on the, of, uh, the, on the webpage. Otherwise, that's it for this webinar today. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Maria and Esther, for, for excellent um, answering to the questions. And uh, see you next time. Take care. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.